Judges chapter 3. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. We see that word test. We noticed this in the last chapter when God tested Abraham and told him to kill his son Isaac. That was in Genesis 22. I want us to point out a couple other verses of this testing that God does, and it's in order to test our hearts. God doesn't test us so that he can know how we're going to respond. God tests us so that we can know how we're going to respond. Are we going to hear the voice of God and are we going to obey? Or are we going to hear the voice of God and disobey? This is the test. So Genesis 22 is where Abraham is tested by God. And at the end of this chapter, God says, because you have obeyed my voice. It's like Abraham passed this test. So a couple other verses to look at. Exodus 15, 25. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments, we're going to talk about that in just a second, then I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. This was the test. Are they going to diligently listen to the voice of God? Are they going to diligently seek after him and obey his commandments? If you flip over one more chapter to Exodus 16, 4, we see it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. This is pretty clear. In this story, God is sending down bread or manna from heaven. And he tells them, only go out every morning and gather what you need for that day. Don't get too much. Don't get for tomorrow. Don't get for the week. Do we really think that God couldn't have made manna last a whole week, a month, or even a year? I'm pretty sure that he could have done that. But he intentionally told the people, only go out every day and gather what you need for that day. That was his command. And that was his test. And some people gathered too much and what happened to the manna, we know it turned into worms and maggots. It was unedible. This was the test, whether they will walk in my law or not. Okay, flip over to Exodus 20, 20. This is where Moses receives the 10 commandments and he's about to give it to the people. And he's given the 10 commandments to the people and the, all the people see the thunder and the flash of lightning and they see the smoke from the mountain and they're terrified. They're terrified. And Moses says to the people in verse 20, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The test was, here's the Ten Commandments, here's God's laws, here's what God is saying, here is God's voice to you. Are you going to obey or not? This is the test. And it's the test for us today. When God gives us a command, are we going to listen to that command and obey or are we not? Okay, let's move on back into Judges. Verse two, it was only in order that the generations of people might know war. When we think of the land of Canaan, if you grew up in church, you think of the land flowing with two things, milk and honey, right? And God says, life is not always going to be milk and honey. I need the people to experience hardship. I need the people to experience war. I need them to be prepared so that when they have to fight against their enemy, all the foreign nations that are going to come against them, when that happens, I need them to be prepared. And I believe God does this to us today. Of course, he would love to give us milk and honey, and he does. And of course, we would love a life just full of milk and honey all the time. And we do experience that from time to time. But there's a lot of times when God sends hardship to us. And the reason he sends hardship is so that we can learn how to turn to him, learn how to trust him in the difficult times so that we are prepared to fight against the attacks of the enemy. Verse 3, these are the nations 
the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon from Mount Bel Hermon as far as Labo Hamath. Now these are the nations that have been against Israel and these are the nations that have stuck together. They have unified themselves together. They have been unbroken during this time. Verse four, they were for the testing of Israel. God raised up these foreign nations for the testing of Israel to put them through hardship so that Israel would have an opportunity to turn to God. What greater thing in life is there than the opportunity to turn to God when you are struggling? And that's what God is, is doing to the Israelites right now. He's testing them by raising up foreign nations against them. Let's read verse four again. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord. These are like the 10 commandments that the Lord gave through Moses for their testing which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. There it is. And verse five, so the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Notice that it says Israel lived among these people. This is showing us that Canaan still has full right to this land. They are in full control over this land. And Israel's got to buckle down and learn how to trust God so that they can overcome the land. But as of right now, these tribes, they're the main players here. Verse six, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives and their own daughters they gave to their sons and they served their gods. Now, whether they thought they could advance their families or their property, their land uh, by marrying the Canaanites, we see ultimately that the bad will always corrupt the good. It's very rare that the good influences the bad for the better. And this is what we see in teenagers too, right? A new kid moves into town, he's a good kid, but there's a group of 10 troublemaking teens. Well, if that new kid that moves into town starts hanging out with those 10 troublemakers, it's most likely that that good kid from out of town is gonna turn into a troublemaker. It's unlikely, it's possible, it's unlikely that the new kid from out of town who joins the group of 10 troublemakers will influence the whole group and turn them good. He might persuade one or two to make some better choices, but in the end, that group of 10 will swallow up that new kid who's a good kid if he is allowed to hang out with that group every day over and over and over. When the Israelites gave their daughters to the Canaanites to marry, and when the Israelite men married the Canaanite women, what's happening is they begin to serve the Canaanite gods. Again, just solidifying this idea that the bad will always corrupt the good, rather than the good influencing the bad for the better. Verse 7, So the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asheroth. You know, there's a theme of forgetfulness here. When the people are forgetting about who God is, what he can do and what he has done for them, this is when they start serving the Baals. This is when they start giving their devotion and their allegiance to other gods instead of the true God. And God at this point has to remove his hedge of protection because he cannot have unrighteousness and sin in his presence. Now that doesn't mean that when we're in God's presence, we become perfect. What that means is when we're in God's presence and we are in his hedge of protection, when we sin and when we fall into unrighteousness, we can check it really fast and we can come to God and say, God, cleanse me of this. Take this away from me. Forgive me for what I've done. And he does. He's faithful to do that. And so we can remain in his presence, in his hedge of protection. And this is what the people are forfeiting at this point. They're serving other gods. They're serving the gods of the Canaanites. And because of this, their lifestyle is reflecting a life that is not in obedience to, to God. It's in rebellion against God. And that sin is what pushes them outside of God's hedge of protection. 